So we're going to move to our very last session today. It will be a very short session, um, but it covers uh, the topic of uh, teaching interdisciplinary data science. And I think that as a university, we have a responsibility to help uh, in reaching out to a broader, uh, increasingly broader audience of students and faculty interested in engaging in AI and data science technologies. I think that um, uh, it's come up this morning in the panels, Paul Thompson and, and Gerard Hobert both uh, mentioned this, just the, the increasing interest in having more expertise in AI and data science in uh, almost every domain um, and department that you see in the university. So, so to speak to this, uh, we have um, uh, Gary Painter, who is the chair of the Department of Public Policy at the Seoul Price School of Public Policy. He's also the director of the Seoul Price Center for Social Innovation and director of the Homelessness Policy Research Institute. Uh, he's a professor of public policy and um, he's very involved with our program on public policy data science, uh, our master's degree, and uh, he's going to motivate the need for this interdisciplinary knowledge about data science and public policy. Gary? Well, thank you so much for inviting me, Yolanda, and it's been a pleasure to listen to the panelists that come before. And in many ways, I probably don't have to do much, of, uh, much work because they've provided the foundation for understanding why there are these critical public policy issues that really can be benefit from the tools that are emerging. Um, and, and I think in some sense, my remarks are gonna be quite brief and we'll simply uh, touch on a, 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 a real narrow slice of some of the issues, but it will at least demonstrate the possibilities um, that are in front of us if we can collaborate in these ways. And also, you know, some of the, the cautions as we collaborate and how to take these next steps in, in a way that actually leads us to better outcomes um, given past approaches. So I'm just gonna just put up a, just a short slide deck to help frame the, the conversation. And um, I don't even know if it's the right title to be honest, but you know, understanding it, that data science is a critical tool is, is now not up for debate. Um, the question is how do you apply it in, in, and bring those innovations to practice? And then for us as educators, how do we actually educate the next generation of, for my purposes, public policy professionals so that they can actually be equipped with the tools they need to do their jobs most effectively to serve society. And, and so to that end, I think answering this question is fundamental and I'm only gonna be talking about a couple of the main points, which are the second two bullet points. Um, it, it's, it's useful to reflect on some of the other traditional data centric approaches in public policy, some of which were mentioned by previous panelists you know, we have tended to rely on econometric techniques to identify causal impacts of programs in the past to kind of help us assess whether the kinds of choices we're making in, in public policy are benefiting society or, or they're harming society. Um, there's also other suites of tools that, you know, range from benefit cost analysis to cost effectiveness analysis um, to cost utility analysis and so forth that are asking different kinds of questions, but again, assessing you know, whether we're making sound investments. Um, I think that the addition of some of the tools that we're talking about here, whether it's machine learning or neural networks or computation, all uh, approaches, you know, they don't necessarily conflict. They actually can work quite complementary fashion to these tools. But I think what we're seeing is that we, we now have the ability to improve performance in the public sector and social sector more broadly in real time in ways that we never had before. And that's really exciting. We, we tended to have to rely on data that was potentially, you know, two years old, maybe one year old if we're lucky, and, and maybe quarterly. Um, but so often, you know, we, we just simply weren't able to make decisions in real time that could really benefit the communities that we serve. Um, and then these tools have also been really powerful to identify new relationships between variables that were previously unknown. I'll talk just a little bit about that. So I'll give a couple examples that I think going to anchor our thinking here. And, and I know we don't have a lot of time, but I'm happy to follow up with, with folks who want to uh, dig a little deeper. So in policing it, um, it, it's not been the case that we haven't been using even what we might call big data. The, the Comstat sort of 
data has been around for you know more than a decade where people are able to assess um, you know where crimes are happening and, and how to deploy resources and so forth within the police department but i think where the the tools of data science are really emerging that can I, I think have huge benefits is that we can add real-time external data to what police have been using internally to deploy resources effectively. Uh, so for instance, we know from other studies that there's a relationship between pollution events and crime. So if you're tracking pollution in real time, air quality, et cetera, that is beneficial. We know there's a connection between people who are you know, experiencing public health events or health events and ER visits in real time. And that can have impacts on where there are challenges within the community at a particular point in time. Um, and as been mentioned in lots of different circles, you know, the way that people are searching for you know, various challenges in their community or, or using tools like the next doors of the world, the, the ring notifications, all that kind of thing, actually can be helpful to assess where events are happening and deploying resources, again, in real time. And I think that's the real innovation um, that goes beyond just simply using big data and, 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 and using tools to assess that data. Another one that I think is really exciting um, in front of us and for which, you know, us who are here in Los Angeles, you know, it, it, it is a, a challenge, a grand challenge that is acutely felt um, by all of us, and that's homelessness. And one of the things that wasn't the case in the past um, is that homelessness tended to be provided by a network of homeless service providers, typically after people became homeless. Um, and then people were attached to a shelter system or perhaps permanent housing. What we're able to do now is to take, you know, vast treasure troves of data, um, such as exist in LA context and in LA County across all of their data systems. So we can look at their criminal justice probation systems, we can look at their health, behavioral health systems, their child support services, the general support services, et cetera. And we can see what kinds of services people are receiving within those systems. And we can observe whether those people had actually had any incidents of homelessness. And because of that, what we're able to do is we're able to actually identify people who are at most risk of becoming homeless later to prioritize outreach. And I think, you know, a lot of these structures are, you know, are not quite there yet, but they're, they're definitely in development and are quite promising. And when you recognize that you have um, true uh, scarce resources in these areas, you have to have a way of kind of working with your outreach workers, your case managers, et cetera, to prioritize those who are most at risk of other events, whether within the system you're serving, like uh, health services, or experiencing events, for instance, of homelessness. So those are just some examples that are exciting. In one case, we're bringing real-time data um, with respect to policing. In another case, we're losing data across multiple departments in ways that they were never used before, but machine learning tools can be used to really harness that data. The, the, the next real, I think, advantage is to, that we can identify new relationships. And, and I realize now my time is short, but I wanted to give this example of just, uh, you know, we know that neighborhoods matter. That's the simplest way to put this. And the typical approach would be to identify causal relationships or refined theory. Um, that's what we do in the social sciences, but now we're able to use these enhanced tools to uncover new relationships to understand. And I can certainly say more about that um, down the road. I think the challenges in front of us are, 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 are important to consider. Um, I know there was already conversations about data science for good earlier today. And so, you know, this question that I pose, if a data generating system is based on a discriminatory environment, how do we actually use that to benefit society? So it's not quite garbage in, garbage out, but if it is the case that our system's data is generating something that's gonna, you know, predispose us to finding something, um, we may not end up actually, you know, using this tool as effectively as it might. And, and there's these other questions that I pose here. So if we have relationships between variables changing over time and space, how do you actually construct policies that tend to be enduring over years? 
Another question that I asked here is how do you account for political decision making in the use of data science, um, especially you know, for politicians as these techniques are evolving rapidly, um, it is, tends to be the case that they're afraid to use new information based on things that they don't understand, or more importantly, their staff doesn't understand. And so to that end, it's really critical that we educate the next generation so that they can continue to inform policymakers. With that, Yolanda, um, let me turn it back over to you. And I apologize for using a little bit of extra time. No problem at all. That was great. Thank you so much. Um, I want to talk briefly about um, how we design interdisciplinary data science programs that um, help us uh, uh, teach data science to uh, our students. I hope you can see this slide. Um, so I'm the director of data science programs in the Department of Computer Science in the Viterbi School of Engineering at USC. And the way that we look at data science is that we're trying to bridge between computer science and the different areas of study. So in uh, computer science, we may study deep machine learning algorithms. Uh, in data science, we start to focus very much on uh, data mining for specific types of data, scalable data management systems, and so on. And then to bridge with the different areas of study, we start to uh, be very specific about uh, the kinds of data mining that we apply to that discipline. So you heard this morning about uh, uh, spatially uh, informed data mining. Uh, we may be mining public policy documents and so on. Uh, and then the different areas of studies do have different theories that they would refine. And uh, it's useful to identify causal relationships as Gary was mentioning. Uh, so, so they're thinking of all of this data as a way to improve their theories. So as we move to the left, there's more and more formalization of the computational aspects of the problems. But as we move to the right, computer science is more and more applied. So in the interdisciplinary data science realm, um, how do we teach these skills? So we have um, uh, courses to teach data science to computer scientists uh, and that are shown on the left. And we will uh, present them tomorrow morning uh, in the first short session of the symposium, if you're interested in that. I'm going to focus on our interdisciplinary data science programs. The pioneering one was started by John Wilson, who you just heard in the panel uh, on spatial data science. Um, we have another one on communication data science. Uh, public policy is newer, as is uh, healthcare data science and environmental data science. In these uh, interdisciplinary programs, we make the programs accessible to non-computer science students. So they don't have any engineering background when they come into these master's programs. And so we have very carefully designed introductory courses on computational thinking and on programming. So they, they learn to think in a computing friendly way about data. And a very unique feature is that we do cover all areas of data science. We'll teach uh, basic statistics. We'll teach uh, lots of different aspects about data privacy and so on. But we'll always emphasize the computing innovations that are that uh, are uh, really propelling the data science revolution. Uh, so the students really understand the foundations of computing, algorithms and data, AI and machine learning, scalable data systems. So uh, the students actually learn about Turing machines. They understand what algorithm complexity is and how, uh, why it matters. Uh, they know the basics of uh, Amdahl's law. And so they don't just learn about map reduce and parallelism. They really have a more technical understanding of why it matters. They don't just learn about knowledge graphs as a technique to use, but they learn about what's the closed world assumption and why uh, that changes everything. And they understand computational um, reproducibility. And so they really have a, a really dense um, uh, computing background coming out of these programs. So, so as an example, if we focus on public policy, they will learn about uh, how to improve data analysis in the government to improve accountability, performance, quality of services, um, collecting data from citizens, what does that involve and uh, uh, how to do that responsibly, and really how to incorporate data science processes in government and public policy. 
And so we have uh, these basic core introductory data science classes that when students come in with some programming experience, they can skip and take more electives in data science. And then on the public policy side, we teach uh, foundational quantitative courses uh, for the students. Um, they have a lot of electives. We have uh, uh, electives on fairness, on user interface design, uh, but also on uh, machine learning and data mining, uh, and then a capstone course at the end that really helps them see uh, how to work in a group to apply the ideas that they're learning in the degree. We also pay attention to PhD thesis research. So a lot of PhD students across USC are learning uh, to do data science research and they take a lot of data science courses. So we recognize their skills uh, through graduate certificates. And so depending on the depth of study that they do, they may get a, a certificate in data science foundations or on applied data science. And this motivates and rewards them for uh, incorporating data science. Um, we must be doing something right. This is a recent study of um, LinkedIn graduates from different universities and their current jobs. And it shows that uh, USC graduates are um, in the top five schools that um, big tech is hiring from. So uh, we really teach the students great skills in this, in, uh, this uh, data science area. One of the reasons may be that we really pay attention to uh, recommendations from the National Academy to teach not just technical, te technical aspects of data science, but also uh, how to um, uh, obtain what they term as data acumen, which enables data scientists to make good judgments and decisions with data, to really have uh, accumulated some practical experience to think about data problem, uh, recognize their skills and their lack of skills in, in some aspects of a data science project. So, so we try to teach data acumen very deeply. And one of the ways in which this happens is that uh, USC has a, a center for interdisciplinary data science with semester long projects uh, that faculty proposed uh, students uh, work on uh, in groups of four or five students. And throughout the whole semester, they will uh, attach a problem each student looks at it from a different perspective they have different skills and uh, they have presentations mid-semester and at the end of the semester we also have a very active uh, student organization they hold office hours to answer questions from any students we all know how hard it is sometimes to um, uh, implement data science solutions they give tutorials invited talks and so on so with this um, uh, I'm happy to have shared with you some of our um, approaches to teaching data science across the campus. Uh, tomorrow morning, uh, we will continue the symposium um, at 8.45 a.m. Pacific, 11.45 a.m. Eastern. We will open with a short session on uh, uh, the, the approach to education that we take at USC for AI and data science. Um, from a more computer science perspective. And then we will have two um, sessions with presentations of speakers, as well as a poster session. And I look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Thank you. We will end the session here and we can stop recording and